Welcome to South Bank Centre's book podcast, where you'll hear us in conversation with the people shaping arts and culture today. If you want to hear from some of the biggest and most influential names in contemporary literature, then you're in the right place. In this latest episode of the podcast, we're going to feature highlights from another great event in our 2019 autumn literature season for your listening pleasure. Good afternoon. I'm Debo Amen, Literature Programmer here at Southbank Centre, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Mallory Blackman in Conversation. As many here will recognise, Mallory Blackman, through her writing, has truly given the world something special. To be honest, if 14-year-old me knew I'd one day meet and introduce an event with her, well, he'd look at me dead in the eye and say, sit, just don't mess it up, and maybe get a haircut. That excitement would have come from the fact that not only was Noughts and Crosses an amazing book with a gripping story and brilliantly realised characters, but that it also enabled us to see ourselves in others and the world through a new lens. This continues with the latest and fifth edition to the series, Crossfire. Chairing today's event is Toby Cheramateng, an award-winning producer based in South London. She has worked at Bush Theatre, Roundhouse, Afropunk, London, and Gaudem, is the founder of the Black Ticket Project, and won the Inspiration of the Year Award at Stylist Magazine's first Remarkable Women Award in March 2019. Also joining us today, we have the actors Josh Dillon and Patterson Joseph from Mammoth Screen's highly anticipated adaptation of Noughts and Crosses for the BBC. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the team at Penguin Live, our partners for this event. Now, please join me in welcoming Patterson Joseph. Chapter 14, Callum. I don't know how long I sat there watching the sun burn into the sky as it set, watching the night grow steadily more secretive. Why had my life suddenly become so complicated? For the last year, all I could think about, or even dream about, was going to school, Sefi's school. I was so busy concentrating on getting into Heathcroft that I hadn't given much thought to what I'd do when I actually got there. I hadn't really thought about what it would be like to be so unwanted. And what was the point, anyway? It wasn't as if I'd get a decent job after it. No cross would ever employ me for more than the most mundane, menial job, so why bother? But I wanted to learn. A yawning hole deep inside me was begging to be filled up with words and thoughts and, and ideas and facts and fictions. But if I did that, what would I do with the rest of my life? What would I be? How could I ever be truly happy knowing that I could do so much more, be so much more than I would ever be allowed? I was trying so hard to understand how and why things were the way they were. The crosses were meant to be closer to God. The good book said so. The son of God was dark skinned like them, had eyes like them, had hair like them. The good book said so. But the good book said a lot of things, like love thy neighbor, and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If nothing else, wasn't the whole message of the good book to live and let live? So how could the crosses call themselves God's chosen and still treat us the way they did? Okay, we weren't their slaves anymore, but dad said the name had changed, but nothing else. Dad didn't believe in the good book. Neither did mum. They said it had been written and translated by crosses, so it was bound to be biased in their favour. But the truth was the truth, wasn't it? Noughts. Even the word was negative. Nothing. Nil. Zero. Non-entities. It wasn't the name we'd chosen for ourselves. It was a name we'd been given. But why? I don't understand. The words erupted from me in an angry rush, heading for the sky and beyond. I sat there for I don't know how long, furious thoughts darting around my head like blue bottles, my head aching, my chest hurting, until I suddenly snapped out of it with a jolt. Someone was watching me. I turned sharply in a a shock like static electricity zapped through my body. 
Sefi was further up the beach, standing perfectly still as the wind whipped around her, making her jacket and skirt billow out. We were about seven meters apart, or seven million light years, depending on how you looked at it. Then Sefi turned, she turned around, she started to walk away. Hey everyone. Um, thank you all so much um, for joining us on this Sunday afternoon to have this in conversation with Mallory Blackman. I am gassed, gassed with a Y in the middle <laughs> to be sitting opposite you right now. Um, I, I just wanted to start, I guess, way, 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 way back. I think when, whenever I talk to people about the first time that they read your book, um, for some of us, for a lot of us, it was in school. And I guess I just wanted to know 11-year-old Mallory Blackman, who was she, what was she doing, what was she into, was she writing, was she reading, kind of at that point, who, who were you? Well, um, at 11 years old, I was, I had an awful lot of imagination, I lived in my head a lot, I think I had an optimistic view of the world, but I was kind of happy with my own company. I was always being told off for daydreaming and for having too much imagination. And it's kind of ironic that I, that's how I make my living now. But because um, I remember my sort of friends will tell you that I, for, for, I used to go to school with a satchel and in the bottom of my satchel, I had a, a, a black leotard and tights. And, uh, and, I, and I'd made my own utility belt. Um, and, and the idea being that if kidnappers ever came into the school, I would just slip into the toilets, put on my, my outfit, and I'd come out and I would save the day. And I swear to God, I actually um, had that outfit in the bottom of my bag for like two years. <laughs> That was so embarrassing. But, um, you know, and I kind of, and I called myself Black Thorn, and I was going to go, never had a karate uh, um, lesson in my life at the time, but I thought, yeah, I'll come out and do some action. And, you know, so it was sort of like, I was just, I had a just, my imagination was out there, I have to say. Um, so that was kind of me, and I, I, I must admit, I always felt like a bit of a misfit. And, but that said, I, I kind of look back now, and I think, well, actually... That's kind of served me because it's that thing of, I always felt like I was either 15 minutes behind everybody else or 15 minutes ahead. Mm -hmm. And I always saw the world at a slightly different angle to everybody else. And it kind of, and sometimes it was kind of lonely, but it, but it just meant that I had my own, own way of looking at the world. Do you remember the moment where the sort of idea for Noughts and Crosses landed? Was it a sort of light bulb moment that's like, cool, this is the kind of world I'm going to create? Or was there a series of drafts and changing of ideas before you got to that place? No, it was kind of like more... The way it came about was, I, from the time I started writing, I was always being criticised for not writing about racism. It was as if, as a, a black writer, that was the only thing I was you know, allowed to write about. And, um, and I wanted to write the books I'd missed as a child, all the thrillers and mysteries and whodunits, etc. But then it was around the time of the Stephen Lawrence case, and, I, and, that, and the, the way the Lawrence family were treated made me so angry, and I thought, OK, I want to write about racism. I want to write about slavery and the legacy of slavery, racism, and so on. And, and what happened was I was sort of told family and friends that I wanted to write about kind of slavery or racism and, or, you know, both. And, and it was kind of, the response was kind of underwhelming, to say the least, <laughs> because um, some of them were like, oh, my God, what do you want to write about that for? It's so painful. And others were kind of like, oh, God, what do you want to write about that for? It was so long ago. And, and, it, was, and it was just fascinating. And I thought, all these people assuming they know what's going to be in the book before I've written a word. Mm. And so I thought, well, OK, how can I do this so that I play with people assumptions as to what the book is going to contain and then I thought well actually how about if I flip it so that um, white people are the second class citizens at the noughts and crosses are the ones who are kind of have all the, the the jobs in power and so forth and the thing that brought it together was when I got the title because originally I was thinking, oh, what can I call it? And I was thinking snakes and ladders, you know, kind of up the ladder, <laughs> down a snake. And that didn't just, that didn't grab me. And then I kind of thought, mm, mm. And then I thought, actually, hang on, noughts and crosses. Because noughts could describe sort of the white underclass and crosses who, who would, some of them who would consider themselves closer to God in every way. Mm. And I just thought, well, actually, that kind of works. And, then, and, and at the risk of sounding a bit sort of, you know, arty farty literati, um, I love the idea of a kind of, because noughts and crosses is that game that no one plays past, past childhood mm. because you can't win at it. So what's the point? 
So for me, it was a perfect metaphor for racism, because if, if one part of society isn't equal, then no part of society can be equal, can be truly equal. Is there a kind of thing you wanted to achieve in terms of the people that were going to be like reading this book? I think once it was out into the ether, is there, is there a certain way that you wanted or hoped people would respond to it? I, what I hoped was that, um, that it would reach an audience of, of, of kind of just teens and older who would get what I was trying to do and what I was trying to say. And it, the idea of kind of having white people as the ones who are experiencing racism and having to deal with this on a sort of everyday ongoing basis, I kind of just hoped that it would kind of people would read it and think, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And, you know, and um, I mean, things like the plaster scene, I mean, mm. I, I, I've had so many responses to that where people are saying, you know, there's, in, for those who haven't read it, um, there's a girl called Shania and she gets injured and she arrives at school the next day and she's got a dark brown plaster on her forehead and she's a naught. And, um, and Sefi says, oh my God, that stands out. And she says, well, they don't make pink plasters, they only make dark brown ones. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time Sefi's had to think about the fact that, oh my God, you know, plasters are brown. And, and I've had so many responses to that saying, oh, I never thought about that, you know, plasters are pink and whatever. And I thought, yeah, because they're supposed to make a cut more discreet as well as kind of making sure they don't get infected. But on my skin, they really stand mm -hmm. out. And it's things mm -hmm. like, was it last year? Um, where they finally, finally had ballet shoes where were made for people of colour. Mm. And, and in fact, Stormzy had, a, in Glastonbury, he had a sort of um, a yeah. set where he had the two ballet dancers dancing with shoes that matched their skin tone. Four or five years ago, I was, I was in Marks and Sparks buying tights. And it's part of the reason I never I stopped buy, wearing tights, to be honest. And it said, like, you know, flesh coloured or, or nude or something. Mm. I'm looking at these pink tights. <laughs> Well, that's not my flesh colour, and you know, you know, you sigh and you move on. And it's things like that, I yeah. think, that the minority will see that the majority won't necessarily, mm -hmm. that I kind of just wanted to highlight in a book. Not just the big things, but the, the smaller things that are everyday things that you have to put up with as a minority mm -hmm. in this country. The wonderful thing about books is it kind of... When you say, let's sit down and talk about racism, people run in the opposite direction. But, it's, but if you say, let's talk about the book, which actually features that, then it gives you a safe space to kind of explore those, top, those issues and things. So I think when I was in school reading your book, I had you, Maya Angelou, Benjamin Zephaniah were kind of the oh, only... Oh, I'm in good company there. <laughs> <laughs> On my kind of anthology, they were the only kind of black authors that, were, that we were talking about. And I think when you first started out in the industry, even before Noughts and Crosses, did you kind of have a tribe of people that you could, that you went to, um, I guess, in the early stages of the publishing industry? And, and what was it like trying to find that tribe? Or actually, was it very different from that? It was incredibly hard, actually, because when I knew I wanted to write, and I had friends and some members of my family telling me I was wasting my time because they don't publish black people in this country. I didn't have a clue about how to get published. So um, I found um, the City Lit. It's the mm. City Literary Institute, and, it's, and now it's in Keeley Street. God bless them, because they, want, they run some wonderful, wonderful courses. And the very first course I did was Ways Into Writing. And it was just basically, it was kind of um, teaching you form and start finding your own voice. And it was run by a, a tutor called Carol Burns. And she, she was brilliant, but she didn't stand much, any nonsense. And the thing is, I knew I wanted to write. I wasn't quite sure what at that time, whether I was going to write for adults or children or whatever. And, I, and we'd have exercises to do where she'd say, right, I want, she'd give us an exercise and we'd have to write it and then read it out. And she'd also give us exercises to do with, to take home as homework and bring them back the, fo the following week. But every time she asked me to read, I wouldn't. And she'd say, well, Laurie, um, would you like to read your work out? And I'd say, uh, not today, Carol. So, <laughs> not today, Carol. <laughs> and, um, and she put up with this for like a term and a half. And then she'd say, well, Laurie, have you done the exercise? And I said, yes. And she said, would you like to read? And I said, uh, not today, Carol. And then she said, um, she said, Laurie, do you want to be a writer? And I said, more than anything else in the world. And she said, well, excuse my French, and I hope there's no young ears, youngish ears present, but she said, well, you're going to have to shit or get off the port, love. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought, hmm, and everyone burst out laughing, and I'm going, I was feeling absolutely mortified. And I just thought, hmm, hmm, okay. And then I thought, you know what? 
at some point, I'm going to have to show people my stuff. <laughs> and so, and then I started reading it. And you know what? That is some of the best advice I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> if you're going to do something, do it. And then I did a, a writing for children, um, a sort of beginner's course. Mm. And as soon as I started that, I thought, oh, gosh, this is what I want to do. But it was um, eight or nine books sent out to publishers and over two years and 82 rejections le letters later before a publisher finally said yes. So I remember kind of like, I, 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 every time I heard the postman, I'd go charging down the stairs and tear open the letter. I and mean, it was always, dear Mallory Blackman, no thank you. And then the one time I heard the postman, I went charging down the stairs and I tore open the letter and it said, dear Mallory Blackman, we would love to publish your story. And I just stood in the hall and I went, ah! After you put out Knots and Crosses, did you know it would, be, it would become a series? Did you know there were going to be books after that? Or? Well, um, what happened was I thought I would get the whole story of Callum and Sefi and their daughter uh, grow, sort of growing up all in one book. And then um, at the end of Knots and Crosses, I'd hit page 400 and whatever, and she'd just been born. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, OK, that's going to be two books. And then I got to, like, a page... 300 and a high figure in, in knife age and she was like 18 months old and I thought okay it's going to be three books but that's it <laughs> and, uh, and then I wrote checkmate and I thought right it's finished that's it enough um, and as far as I was concerned it was finished mm. and then a uh, minor character in checkmate Toby Durbridge he started kind of whispering in my ear and it was around the time we had the um, the sort of proliferation of knife crime starting up and uh, and and he was talking to me about kind of joining a gang and 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 how they kind of, it's kind of blood in, blood out. And, and I wanted to sort of write about that. And so that's how Double Cross came about with, um, in, because of current events. And the same with Crossfire, it was kind of like Toby Durbridge whispering in my ear again, so, but now he's an adult and he's a politician determined to get to the top mm. and he doesn't care who he has to step on to do it. So it was kind of like, again, inspired by... Trump's inauguration and Brexit and so on. I thought, mm. again, he started whispering in my ear. So the, the books have always been inspired by current events. I think with Noughts and Crosses, it was just me wanting to kind of write a book about racism, overtly about racism. Um, but the way I see it is, it's two sets of trilogies. It's kind of um, Noughts and Crosses, Knife Edge and Checkmate as one sort of trilogy. And the second one, is, the second trilogy is Double Cross, Crossfire. And the one I'm working on at the moment is Endgame. And that's mm. going to be the final one of, of that. And then I'm not writing anymore. But you know what? But <laughs> Are you I'm sure? Not anymore, Crosses, <laughs> but you know what? I've said that before and, you know, never say never. But at the moment, Endgame is going to be it for Noughts and Crosses for me. With Crossfire, I think the main question I had is why you felt Crossfire had to exist in the world of Noughts and Crosses. It could have been a book on its own. It could have existed in a completely different world. What about it did you think had to continue this series? I think for me it was kind of like, because it was Toby who was kind of, his story was unfolding in my mind and it was him kind of as a grown-up and he's kind of embraced this thing of, well, if he can't have what he wants in his life, he's going to be, he's going to go after power. And I, I kind of had the characters all there, you know, sort of with, with Dan and, and um, Toby and Callie and, and the fact that, you know, Toby, Toby's thing is he's going to be the first North Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And you still get the rhetoric about, oh, it's the first person of colour doing this and the first person of colour doing that, making the news. And I just think, this is the 21st century, this should not be news. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like him kind of saying, tell my story, tell my story in my ear, I guess. And, and it just seemed to fit in really well with that kind of world. And I love the idea of three generations of sort of family presented in mm. the books, and that's it. Has there... I think what I've always loved about the series, I guess, is, like, the language that's been used for each character. Like, it definitely felt like each character had their own way of speaking and it was very relevant to the language that I would also hear in my day-to-day. -day. Has there been a different way of writing for young people when you started writing Crossfire in relation to how you're writing Knots and Crosses, when you're kind of writing those characters and the way that they speak? 
Absolutely, and I think they had to be because it's a sort of it's a, a next generation on. So the language has changed. I mean, language is always evolving. So the way they talk about things or some of the idioms they use or whatever mm. had to change. Um, they use phrases that perhaps you know Sefi wouldn't have because she's now kind of like an, a sort of older woman and whatever. So. So, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely, it's kind of like trying to listen into that and kind of have an ear for that, but not following kind of current trends mm. um, because then they date the book. Yeah. But kind of, kind of um, being aware of some phrases and whatever and kind of then trying to make them my own. And that's where my daughter comes in useful because, <laughs> you know, because I will say certain phrases and she'll just look at me and go, Mum, don't. When it came to adapting the series for stage and screen actually how how did that feel because I guess in a in a book there's so much that you can explore mm. and it can be as kind of short as long as you want it to be yeah. whereas I guess theatre or film and television to an extent have kind of certain restrictions in terms of it can kind of be this long and it'll be okay if yeah. it goes on this long yeah. you're getting into dangerous territory what was that process like in terms of trying to take the whole book of Noughts and Crosses and almost condense it into a series or a play? Well, um, you know what, but I, because I didn't write the scripts for the, the series or, or for the play, um, I got to see them and I got to comment and so on, so, which was lovely. But you see, in a, it, the, what, the beauty of a book is I can say, um, and half the planet blew up, <laughs> you know, and then <laughs> but, you try filming that, that's a lot of money as far as visual effects <laughs> and things are So they soon bring you down to earth about, no, nope, can't afford that, can't do that, whatever. Um, but what was lovely, um, it, it, with the pilot production and, and, in fact, and the RSC production when they did it in 2008, and with the TV series, is they all sent me the scripts and asked for my comments, and then with the TV series, I've been sent the rough, rough, the rough cuts of um, each of the episodes, so I got to comment on those as well, which has been amazing. So, and I, and I know I've been really lucky because basically when a production company um, says they want to option your book, uh, they're paying you to go away as a writer mm. they, they, it's basically take the money now over there go away go away <laughs> and, and, um, and I've been really lucky that I've been included in that process with all the sort of people who've kind of adapted my book do you with the books with each book have you had a favourite character or a character that you've ended up disliking yourself even though you wrote mm. them oh god yeah <laughs> oh god yeah um, I mean um, Jude is a nasty piece of work and I, I loathed him oh my god <laughs> Oh my God! But what my hope is, people would read him and understand why he was doing the things mm. he was doing. They might not kind of sympathise with what he was doing, but they'd understand yeah. why he was doing it. And and I, especially in Knife Edge, where there's a bit where um, he has it's his last chance to rejoin the human race, and he doesn't take it. Mm. And I remember writing it, um, and a sort of chill went down my spine as I was writing it. It's, it's him and this girl, Kara, and he does something really awful to this girl. And I, a chill went down my spine when I was writing it, and I thought, oh, God, God should I leave that in there? And I thought, no, don't you dare change it. <laughs> and I left it in, but he's, he becomes a really, really nasty piece of work yeah. and, and, and in fact I, I was a, a friend of mine was saying that uh, another author friend was saying that she heard that um, someone was saying that, that all characters are really a part of the author and I thought, oh God, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, 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 you know, my favourites, I guess, I mean, it would be Callum and Sefi and then uh, and Toby, I think. I, I really like Toby. And I think, um, and so I think, you know, we, those were my favourite ones. And I think, and, and I kind of, I feel sorry for Sefi because I think um, she's very naive to begin with because she's had a very kind of, sheltered upbringing mm. and it's through Callum that she kind of learns how the real world is for other people who are in a less privileged position and but she she's kind of doing her best but she's still people you know she's still kind of getting flat for it and I just mm. and I and so I really like her I think she kind of goes through a lot but I do think it, when I was writing the book what was fascinating to me was um of all the characters I've created in all my books I'd say Callum's personality is probably closest to my own. Mm. And a lot of the stuff he goes through, 
certainly the school staff, not the terrorism staff, but, but, I hate wow. swag, but all the school staff uh, was based on stuff, true stuff that happened to me. Mm. But I said to my history teacher, how come you never talk about black scientists and inventors? And she said, because there aren't any, Laurie. And I thought, well, there must be. I'm sure there are. But I, I, we were never taught about any of them. And I had to teach myself in my 20s. I found the black bookshop in Islington and they got all my money. But after rent and food, it was like just spending all my money in that bookshop and educating myself. Mm. And, um, and, and I remember the first time I traveled first class on a train and the ticket inspector accused me of stealing the ticket. And this, this was when I was 17. And I was so, so mortified and everyone's staring at me and he said, well, you know, where did you get that from? And he said, well, could, what are you doing in first class? And did you, where, did you steal the ticket and whatever? And it was just really, really nasty. And then the, the and, and so of course that went in the book. He said, Writing books is a wonderful way to get revenge. <laughs> Writing is kind of like my psychiatrist's couch. Mm. And it is a very good way of getting revenge. Because I remember right, one bit that's in Checkmate where I was walking with my daughter, because my daughter's dual heritage, and we were going into Tesco's or wherever, and, uh, and this was when she was like six, seven, and two black guys were coming towards us, and they looked at my daughter and looked at me, and then one of the black guys went, you slag, and walked past me, and I was so angry. Oh my God, I was so angry. And I wanted to turn around and I was just going to give him a full mouthful. But my daughter was just chatting away and kind of, ch and I thought, no, because I'm going to upset my daughter. So they got written into checkmate. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the South Bank Centre Books podcast in all the usual places. For more information about upcoming events, go to southbankcentre.co.uk or look us up on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram.